what a great event. I'm so, I'm so terribly honored to be here at this extraordinary uh, congruence of, of human capital that is passionate about design, passionate about cities, passionate about architecture. Because very much, cities are the future. And I think it's very much organizations like Resight that are crowdsourcing the brilliance that will make cities, cities flourish in the 21st century. To make things absolutely clear from the beginning that I am an economist, with the usual complete lack of aesthetic sensibility that you should correctly attribute to any economist. I'm going to start with this graph. Um, and this is a picture of Europe. There you have it. I've, I've gotten rid of everything that's beautiful in Europe and reduced it to two line graphs. Um, but what I've done is I've taken the 1,114 regions within Europe, and I've split them up on the basis of their density levels. Because at their heart, cities are the absence of physical space between people. Cities are density, proximity, closeness. And what you can see from the blue line is the relationship between density and earnings across Europe. The places that are dense are economically productive and wealthy. The places that are less dense are not so. This is something economists call agglomeration economies. This tendency of humanity, which we have seen for decades and centuries, to become more productive when surrounded by a maelstrom of human activity. The three largest metropolitan areas in the U.S. produce 18% of America's total income, while including only 13% of America's population. And if all of America saw its per capita productivity levels rise to that scene in the New York metropolitan area, America would become 43% richer. Now, the blue line, the, the red line is somewhat more surprising. You can see it again going up there. Um, what that shows is population growth between 2000 and 2010 and initial population density. We are often used to think of people leaving dense enclaves to populate empty spaces off in the middle of nowhere. But in fact, at the start of the 21st century, instead of spreading out, we're coming closer together. This is the exact same graph. We seem to have lost a graph. Uh, well, there is exactly the same graph for the United States. And if you were to see that graph for the United States, which I assure you is a doozy of a graph, uh, you would see that, in fact, the most dense half of America's, the most dense tenth of America's counties have incomes that are 50% higher than the least dense half of America's counties. And if anything, the relationship between population growth and initial population density is even stronger in the U.S. than it is elsewhere. In this case, what I've done is I've split metropolitan areas up on the basis of their density levels. And here you're looking at housing price growth between 1996 and 2012. America, of course, has been through this great housing price tsunami where prices rose and fall, fell, particularly in sunbelt areas that had the largest convulsions of prices. But over the long haul, what you see that price growth has occurred overwhelmingly in those areas that have density that in fact low-density America remains expensive as it has been. The demand, which is reflected so clearly in the price of housing, is for higher-density areas. And indeed, speaking as a native New Yorker, it is sort of remarkable to see this city that was going through such tough times when I was a child in the 1970s come surging back as a capital of the information age. Boston as well has transformed itself in the 22-odd years that I've, I've been there. And indeed, London, Paris, right? These are all cities that have come surging into this century. Now, whatever is happening in the developed world in terms of urban strength is nothing relative to the urban transformation that is happening in the poorer nations of today. Gandhi famously said that the future of the nation, the growth of the nation, depends not on its cities, but on its villages. But with all due respect to the great man, on this one, he was completely and totally wrong. Because, in fact, the future of India does not depend on its villages, which remain mired in the same poverty that has marked rural India for millennia. The future of India is being made in Bangalore, in Mumbai, in Kolkata, in Delhi, in cities that are providing pathways out of poverty into prosperity, in cities that are transforming the subcontinent and, in fact, transforming the world. In 2007, we passed this remarkable halfway point where more than 50% of humanity now lives in cities. And while there are certainly huge challenges associated with the growing megalopolises of the developing world, it's hard on net not to cheer for that urban transformation. Because when you compare those cities that are more than, when, compare those countries that are more than 50% urbanized to those countries that are less than 50% urbanized, the more urbanized countries have on average incomes that are five times higher and infant mortality levels that are less than a third 
I know of no other pathway to wealth that doesn't run through cities. Um, one way to see this transformation is with this figure. And what I'm showing you here, holding inflation constant, is the share of countries that are more than a third urbanized. Share of countries that are more than a third urbanized. So the way to read this would be, let's just say, choose your, the middle of the line. Those are countries that have between $2,000 and $3,000 per capita GDP. The red line shows that over 80% of those countries right, are more than one third urbanized. So overwhelmingly, those countries have at least a third of their population that are, that are one third urbanized. Um, the blue line shows what was true in 1960. So in 1960, those, there were about half of those countries that were one third urbanized. Now move towards the places of extreme poverty. Move down the, down the map. Look at those countries that have less than $1,000 per capita GDP. That's the bottom one. You, see an, you don't see a blue line there, right? That's actually not because I screwed up. That's because there was no such thing as a country that was that poor that was one-third urbanized in 1960. In 1960, extreme poverty meant rural poverty. What has happened is that today, over 40% of those countries are one-third urbanized. Right? That urbanization has come not just to Prague, but to Kinshasa, to Port-au-Prince, to some of the poorest places on the planet. Right? That's an amazing transformation. It's a transformation that is fraught with peril, because cities are also difficult to manage. But it is a transformation that also has tremendous promise. And indeed, as we think about the, tr the troubles of the 21st century and the opportunities, the great growing cities of the developing world, the cities of poverty, are both the places that have the biggest problems and the most opportunities to really transform urban space. And if I were going to make one pitch for you, as you think about the next three days, don't just think about how to make Prague more beautiful. Think about what you can do for Kinshasa. Think what, about what you can do for the poorer cities of the world, which really require good urbanism as much as any place else, uh, any place else does. It is normal to look at, these are the favelas of Rio that have come into high relief during the World Cup games, to look at these favelas and think to themselves, what a condemnation of urban space that they have so many poor people living in them. But I, I would submit to you that that's the wrong interpretation of urban poverty. Cities don't have poor people because cities make people poor. Cities have poor people because cities attract poor people. Poor people come to Rio, not because their outside opportunities are, are so great, but because they're so terrible, right? And just because life in a favela is very, very difficult, it shouldn't blind us to the fact that life in the rural northeast of Brazil is even worse. That in fact, they're not fools when they're making this decision. And indeed, you know, cities have economic opportunity. They have a better social safety net. In the West, they have the ability to get around without a car for every adult. My own work with Matthew Kahn of UCLA finds that poverty rates go up near new subway stops. This is not a sign that subway stops are impoverishing people. It's a sign that subway stops are doing exactly what you'd hope that they would do, which would be to provide a means of transport for people who start with less income. So there's this paradoxical effect, which is that as cities get better at helping poor people, they attract more pe poor people and actually become more unequal which does not mean that we should stop trying to help poor people, but should, we should recognize that urban inequality is as much a sign of urban success as of urban failure. Now, this one way to think about the success of cities in the developing world is to look, instead of income, to look at happiness, to look at life satisfaction. Typically, in the cities of the West, people who live in cities don't say that they're happier than people who live in, in rural areas. After all, no self-respecting New Yorker, or Parisian for that matter, is going to tell some interviewer how happy they are with life. They'd be kicked out of their cafe or, or bar for doing so. Um, but in the developing world, the gap in life satisfaction between rural and urban living is as obvious as the urban effect on health, which is also positive. The people who live in big cities typically say that they're much happier in India than the people who live in rural areas. And this is across the world. I've taken the countries of the world and divided them on the basis of urbanization. Respondents have rated their happiness on a 1 to 10 scale. And as you can see, the places that are most urbanized have people who say that they are the happiest. And this is true even controlling for the income of the particular areas. Now, in some sense, all of this positive stuff about cities is a paradox. We live in an age in which distance is dead in which the cyber seers, the techno prophets, predicted that we would be looking forward to a future in which we would all decentralize to whatever sylvan spot appeals to our biophilia, and we would just dial it in, right? That we wouldn't have to put up the discomforts of urban life anymore. And yet this production, this prediction made during the 1980s has proven to be completely false. 
Instead of continuing our decentralization, cities came back. Instead of moving to electronic cottages in far-flung areas, we've seen skyscrapers rise in pr proud urban areas. We've seen a resurgence of urban life, despite this death of distance. Why is this? Why is it that these new technologies that enabled long-distance communication didn't have the, their predicted effect? Why is it that they made face-to-face -face contact in the cities that enabled that contact more, not less vital? Um, in some sense, this paradox comes into high relief when you think about where cities were 40 years ago. I mentioned that I was born in New York. I mentioned that I, I grew up in New York. And these are two iconic images from the New York during the 1970s. This is President Ford refusing New York's request for a bailout. The New York, the New York Post said that the LA News said that he said to the city, drop dead, which he didn't. But it, he sort of meant it, or at least that's what many people thought. And indeed, during those years, it didn't just seem as if President Ford, but history itself, was telling older, colder cities of the US and Europe that they were headed for the trash heap. New York had the largest industrial cluster of any city in America, larger than automobile production in Detroit, was garment manufacturing in New York City. It was a cluster that was hammered by globalization, 500,000 jobs lost in a short number of years. Accompanying this decline in manufacturing employment was a rise in social distress. Crime rates were out of control. Cities were burning. On top of that, city governments couldn't pay their bills. This combination of deindustrialization and rising social problems meant that New York was a city on the brink of bankruptcy, as Detroit is today. Indeed, a couple of years later, when President Jimmy Carter wandered through the wasteland that the South Bronx had become, it really seemed possible that we would be looking forward to an urban future in which the proud buildings would be reclaimed by the grass that would come out of the ground, that we would be looking forward to a future like that depicted at the end of the Planet of the Apes movie, where the Statue of Liberty would come poking out of the sand in some post-urban uh, apocalyptic world. In some sense, the decline of the industrial city appeared so complete because these cities had lost their original reason for being. If you think about all of the older manufacturing cities of the world, and this is an image of Rotterdam, right, they came about because of transportation technologies, because they were good places to make and move goods. In 1900, every major American city was on a waterway, tw the 20 largest, from the newest Minneapolis on the northernmost navigable point on the Mississippi River to the oldest, New York and Boston, typically where the river meets the sea. There was a good reason for this. Right? It cost as much at the start of the 19th century to ship goods 30 miles over land in America as it did to ship them across the entire Atlantic Ocean. And so we sat, Americans sat perched on the Atlantic seaboard, clinging to the watery lifeline because there was such an advantage of being near the port. And then railroads came and we clung around the railroads. And that was an added advantage as well. And there's no surprise that manufacturing followed these transportation cost advantages, that this was the cost-effective place to put production. But over the course of the 20th century, the advantages of being near the port really plummeted. The one-time gain from being near to rail yards became irrelevant as trucking flooded the country. This is the decline in the cost of moving a ton a mile by rail in the U.S. over the course of the 20th century. It's a 90% decline. So whereas proximity for manufacturing was crucial at the start of the 20th century, by the end of the 20th century, you might as well put that production plant in a lower cost locale in the American South, or might as well put it across the Pacific Ocean to a place where wages are lower. And so manufacturing completely left our urban areas. And of course, this is not particular to the US. I just showed you Rotterdam, Liverpool, 50% of its one-time population, Manchester, Birmingham, Glasgow, the industrial cities of the Europe also hollowed out, right? Places that seemed like they were you know, uh, a shadow of, of the lost age. Um, and some of these cities have not come back. Detroit is, as I've already mentioned, still in bankruptcy. But others have. Others that at one point in time looked no better off than Detroit. In 1971, two jokers put up a billboard on the highway leaving Seattle, asking the last person to leave the city to please turn out the lights. Because Boeing, mighty Boeing, had been cutting back on the number of jobs, and just as no one could imagine a Detroit with a smaller General Motors, no one could imagine a Seattle with a smaller Boeing. This is before Amazon, before Microsoft, before Costco, and Starbucks is at best the faint whiff of an aroma in somebody's nostrils, right? Seattle came back, but not because of manufacturing resurgence. It came back because of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship that was tied to the human capital of the city, 
the skills that make Seattle productive. You know, when you look at Detroit's adults, one in eight, 12% of Detroit's adults have a college degree. More than 50% of Seattle's adults have a college degree. Right? That difference explains why Seattle has done so much better. Because indeed, when you look across cities, both in the US and elsewhere, skills are destiny. This is the relationship between share of the population with a college degree as of the year 2000 and population growth between 2000 and 2010. That five, those are the most educated metropolitan areas in the US, most educated counties, right? Average population growth about 13%. The bottom three, the least educated three-fifths of America's counties, population growth of about 3%, right? Skills are determining which areas are attractive, which areas are innovative. This is the relationship between skills and earnings. And it's not just that becoming more educated makes you wealthier, it's that having educated people around you makes you more productive. Because we learn from people who are near us. This is something economists call human capital externalities, the advantage of having education that's external to you. The fact is that as the share of the population in your metropolitan area with a college degree goes up by 10%, your earnings on average go up by 8%, holding your own years of schooling constant. Right? This was particularly true during the Great Recession in the United States, where having educated neighbors meant you far less likely to become unemployed because educated people are natural entrepreneurs who actually provide opportunities. This is even more true across the, across the world. This is the relationship between math scores and GDP per capita across countries in the world, right? Skills are destiny. And cities exist to connect people, to enable them to learn from one another. Just to put this in perspective, and, and you know, the US as a whole, of course, has a huge skills problem. We're down there. We're actually not at the bottom. This, we're actually in the middle. There's a second graph that shows we're in the middle of the global distribution. The Czech Republic is up there, right, between New Zealand and Japan, right? This is a phenomenal element in the Czech Republic's strengths. Right? The fact that this is a country that has invested in skills is a great source of success. And indeed, when we think about urbanism, we have to think always about how the physical space interacts with humanity and helps to make us more intelligent. Now, in many cities, of course, what urban resurgence has meant has been finance. Occasionally, this is regrettable. Right? It is no healthier to have a one-industry town based on finance than to have a one-industry town built on automobile production. Right? Cities thrive on diversity. But we shouldn't be surprised that cities have particularly attracted financial services. Because, in fact, the great urban edge in the 21st century is enabling people to learn from one another. This has been going on for centuries. And indeed, I believe that cities are responsible for the greatest hits of humanity precisely because they enable those collaborative chains of creativity that are responsible for the greatest things we as a species have done. Even when cities are formed for utterly mundane reasons, think about Chicago, right? The linchpin of a watery ark that went all the way from New York to New Orleans, a city that existed to slaughter cows and move them onto rail yards. Well, Chicago was also the birthplace of the skyscraper, the place where smart architects came together in the 1880s. No single person, William LeBaron Jenny, didn't invent the skyscraper on his own. He was part of a chain of genius, including Sullivan, including Burnham, including Adler, including Root, Root including the great fireproofing engineer Peter B. White. That chain of genius can be seen even more clearly in 15th century Florence, a city built, of course, on wool and banking, but a city that enabled one of the most miraculous chains of genius that humanity has ever seen. Right? Brunelleschi figures out the basic mathematics of linear perspective, how to make two-dimensional spaces seem three-dimensional. He passes them, them along to Donatello, who puts them in low-relief sculpture on the wall of Orson Michele, who passes it along to Masaccio, who puts in the wall of, of the Brancacci Chapel, that marvelous picture of St. Paul finding a silver coin in the belly of a fish, who passes it along to that less than saint monk Fra Filippo Lippi, who passes it along to Botticelli and so forth, a chain of genius, each person riffing on each other person's idea. This is what cities do that matter, and this is what cities have been doing for the last 2,500 years since Socrates and Plato bickered on an Athenian street corner. This is what Wall Street is about as well, right? And I understand it is very natural, to view finance with great hostility, but is ultimately in cities precisely because there's no industry in which being a little bit smarter can make you richer faster than in finance. There's no industry in which the returns to innovation and ideas are more lucrative. That is why this is fundamentally an urban industry. There is a chain of, of innovation in finance that occurs in New York over the last 40 years that is part of its success, a chain that is actually not materially different in terms of the learning than what happened in Florence. <laughs> 
I put up this particular picture of Bloomberg, Bloomberg's uh, wall of City Hall, which is interesting for, th for at least three reasons, one of which is Bloomberg is part of this chain of innovation in finance. The second reason is that Bloomberg is an example of what Jane Jacob talked about when she discussed leaps of innovation from one industry to the other. Because, of course, Bloomberg is not a financial billionaire. He's an information technology billionaire. He's competing with the guys in Silicon Valley, but he's able to compete with them so successfully because he has wisdom that the city has given them because he has run the technology operation at Solomon Brothers, because he's run the Solomon Brothers trading floor. And when he gets kicked out of that firm and starts his own tech company, right, he knows something that no software engineer working outside of Stanford University could know. He knows what other financial traders want, and he's able to deliver them the services that he knows that they need. The city has given them that intellect. But there's another reason why I like this picture, which is it's the Wallace office, right? It's important because it's about space. It's important about how we human beings interact with each other. It's there, that Wallace office at, at City Hall is there because that's how he ran Bloomberg LLP, his company. But that Wallace office was ultimately based on the Solomon Brothers trading floor. Now, trading floors are fascinating things spatially. Here we have some of the wealthiest people on the planet who in a normal industry would be sitting ensconced behind large oaken desks, protected by secretaries, enjoying all the perquisites of privacy that their prosperity has made possible. And yet here they are, right, right on top of each other, sweating on each other. If the popular author Michael Lewis is to be believed, they're getting guacamole on top of each other, right? Why are they doing this? Why are they putting up with all this discomfort when they don't need to? Well, they're there, of course, because knowledge is more important than space. They're there, of course, because it is so important in this industry to know what's going on, they're willing to put up with all sorts of inconveniences to get it. That ultimately, right, is the city writ small. And that's ultimately the answer to the paradox with which I began this talk. Cities have come back because knowledge is more important than space. The paradox is resolved because what globalization and new technologies have done is they've radically increased the returns to being smart. They've radically increased the returns to innovation because you can sell anything all over the world, because you can source it anywhere in the world, right? The more complicated our society is, right, the more difficult it is to communicate ideas and the easier it is to get for, for ideas to get lost in translation. Anyone who's ever taught knows that the hard part about teaching is not knowing your topic. It's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is getting through. Right? And we have evolved over millions of years these wonderful cues for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with each other. Cities have come back because they play to the most central gift we have as human beings. Our ability, when we come out of the womb, to soak up information from the people around us, from our parents, from our peers, from our siblings, even occasionally from our teachers. Right? As our human capital becomes more important, as knowledge becomes more important, face-to-face -face contact and the cities that enable that contact becomes more important. That's why traders work on top of each other, and that's why cities ultimately have come back. This is, of course, you know, a classic image of information being spread in, in, in a European city, right? The anatomy lesson of Dr. Talp, learning from uh, an event which can only happen once a year by law, crowding around, learning what happens. This is what cities do that matters. Now, if you think about the things that cities teach, it's not, of course, the stuff that they learn in schools. It's the things that are taught on the city streets. It's what the great English economist Alfred Marshall wrote about when he said that in dense clusters, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air. And, of course, this idea of knowledge in the air is precisely what makes cities magical. When I think about what's important to have in the air for long-term urban resilience, nothing is more critical than the talent and inclination to become an entrepreneur. Fifty years ago, the economist Benjamin Chinitz was comparing New York and Pittsburgh and noting that New York appeared to be more resilient than Pittsburgh did even then. He argued that this was a result of New York's culture of entrepreneurship inculcated by the garment trade, a trade with very few barriers to entry, very few returns, very low returns to scale, in which anyone with a good idea and a couple of sewing machines could get started. By contrast, Pittsburgh had U.S. Steel, which excelled in training company men who had no idea how to start new businesses. And of course, while Pittsburgh was enormously productive in the short run, when the industry faltered, right, those guys weren't able to think of something new. But the guys from the garment trade, they could start their own companies. They could start movie studios. They could start financial services firms. They could build skyscrapers. All of these things because entrepreneurial talent is fungible. The ability to think of new ideas in one industry also makes you good at thinking of new ideas in another. It is amazing, given how mediocre our measures of entrepreneurship are, how powerful they are at predicting urban resilience. 
What I've done here is I've just sorted metropolitan areas on the basis of the average establishment size. Those ones have a lot of little firms. Those five are marked by U.S. deals, by big firms. Employment growth, almost 200% in those that have small firms, those that have big firms, tiny growth, right? And indeed, even as we look forward to the, to the now thriving factory towns of, of Asia, at some point in time, they will go through their own deindustrialization and they will face exactly the same challenges of reinventing themselves. Now, the most entrepreneurial place on the planet I've ever been is the Jaravi slum of Mumbai. You walk through its dense corridors and you just see human talent at its, at its most miraculous. You know, guys who are sitting on the floor and they're recycling paper boxes, which means cutting them up and turning them inside out so you don't see the old labels. And you walk a little bit further down and there's a ceramics cluster and, and the women who are making the pots are so proud of them, they won't even take any money from you for them. And a little bit further down, there's a, a couple of guys sewing uh, lingerie and you think you're in the lower side of Manhattan in 1905. And a little bit further down, there's a, a group of women sitting on the floor recycling plastics. And you think to yourself, how amazing that they learned there was money in this. And that's what cities are doing. They're enabling people to learn where there are opportunities. And you feel the promise of Indian ingenuity. And you walk out in the street and you see a kid defecating in an unpaved road. And you see that the electricity doesn't work and the water isn't safe to drink. And it reminds you that there are also demons that come with density. That if two people are close enough to give each other an idea face to face, they're also cl close enough to give each other a contagious disease. Right? For thousands of years, cities have been doing battles with these demons that come with density. There's a reason why people who live in Manhattan like government more than people who live in Montana, they need it more. Cities need government to actually manage the downsides of living close to one another. The most important of those downsides is indeed contagious disease. A boy born in New York City in 1900 could expect to live seven years less than the national average. Today, life expectancies in New York are three years longer. Nobody understands, actually, why death rates are lower for older New Yorkers. Some people claim it's just walking more. Some people claim social connection. Among younger New Yorkers, it's really e obvious to see why death rates are lower. Far lower levels of motor vehicle accidents. It's just a lot safer to get in a tram after, taking a few, after having a few drinks than to get behind the wheel of a car. And far lower levels of suicide, which is, of course, a great puzzle of New Yorkers, that even though New Yorkers don't say that they're happy, they're much less likely to kill each other, than pe kill, kill themselves than other, uh, than other people. This didn't happen by accident. This decline in death rates only occurred with massive urban investments in clean water. America's cities and towns were spending as much on clean water at the start of the 20th century as the federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. This required engineering and it required enormous expense. Some problems, however, cannot just be built be built, uh, uh, we can't just build our way out of other problems, right? There's something called, when it comes to highways, there's something called the fundamental law of highway traffic, which is that highway miles traveled increase roughly one for one with highway miles built. If you build it, they will drive it. You can't just keep on building highways and expect anything good to happen. You've got to actually ration the space sensibly. Singapore, second densest country in the world, has streets that move effortlessly all days, all times of the day, because they charge people to use those city streets. Whereas most of our urban areas persist in using, and I don't want to in any sense offend any representatives of, of who remember the old Soviet Union, but there was an old strategy of the Soviet Union giving away groceries at below market prices. And the result occasionally at groceries would be long lines and stock outs at grocery stores. This is what an urban traffic jam is. We take something valuable, which is access to city space, to city streets, we give it away to free, and as a result, we have the urban equivalent of long lines and stock outs. You actually need to charge people for something, for access to something that valuable. Now, when cities are able to deal with the downsides of density, they can be places of remarkable pleasure as well as productivity. The same urban edge in, creation, in creating innovation in software production, in uh, management consulting, also creates innovation in restaurants, also creates innovation in design. Right? Cities are fun because we're able to share magnificent infrastructure built, in this case, over centuries. Cities are also, of course, great for young single people to just come and be there because the thing that young single people want is proximity to other young single people. This is about the rise to the consumer city. And in some sense, the right economic development strategy is to attract and train smart people and then get out of their way, which means quality of life, which means design, is not just about being pleasant, it's about economic development. Because in fact, that design helps to create a place where smart people want to come and live. Now, a downside of succeeding so well as a place of pleasure, uh, as well as productivity, is that if you don't build enough housing, you risk becoming a boutique town affordable only to the wealthy. Um, the declining circles is what happened to new building in Manhattan. The rising triangles is what happened to prices. There is no repealing the laws of supply and demand. When people want to live in a city, 
and you don't build enough housing, the city risks becoming a boutique town affordable only to the rich. This is London's problem, this is Paris's problem, this is New York's problem, right? You need to build housing if a city is going to be affordable. This is what Jane Jacobs got wrong. In so many ways, she was a peerless observer of urban life, and yet she screwed up when she ta starts talking about cities being cheap. I, like her, want cities to be affordable, but she looked at old buildings and noticed they were cheap, and new buildings and noticed that they were expensive, which led her to conclude that the way to promote affordability was to make sure that no one built any new buildings on top of old buildings. That is not how economics works. That is not how supply and demand works. You actually need to build housing to satiate demand. And you want to see what her argument leads to? Look at her own home area of Greenwich Village that she worked so hard to make a preservation district to freeze in amber. When she lived there, this was a place where ordinary New Yorkers could afford to buy. Today, townhouses in Greenwich Village start at $8 million, and you need to be a hedge fund manager to live there. That's what happens with the logic of making buildings, of old buildings leading to affordability. It doesn't work. There's a lot to love about historic preservation. My father was an architectural historian, a curator at the Museum of Modern Art. I believe that our most beautiful old buildings are as precious as anything hanging in the Louvre. But it is not true that you have a free lunch here, right? When you turn down the delivery of density, you're turning down the delivery of apartments for people who want to live in a city. You're turning down the possibility of, of ordinary people who aren't rich coming to start a family in a city. You're turning a city like Paris ultimately into a gated community. And one reason to allow cities to build is actually they're good for the environment. And I want to illustrate this by telling a story about a young Harvard College graduate who, in a beautiful spring day in 1844, went for a walk in the woods outside of Concord, Massachusetts. And he did a little fishing, and the fishing was good because there hadn't been much rain lately. But when he came to cook the fish into a chowder, the wind caught the flames, and they carried them to the nearby dry grass. And a fire started, and it spread, and it spread. And by the time it was done, it was a raging inferno that had burned up more than 300 acres of prime woodland. In his own day, this man was castigated as an enemy of the environment. The Concord Freeman called him a flibberty gibbet, which I think was pretty bad for 1844. And indeed, they were right. I can't think of anyone who did as much damage to the environment as this young man did, right, living in Cambridge or Boston. Today, of course, he is revered as the secular saint of American environmentalism. He is Henry David Thoreau, whose book Walden appears to preach a gospel of what a wonderful thing it is to live surrounded by nature. But his own life, of course, teaches a very different gospel. His own life reminds you that we are a destructive species, and often the best way to take care of nature is to stay away from it, as indeed Thoreau would have done a great deal of good for nature if he had stayed at home in Boston or Cambridge instead of cooking chowders in the woods outside of Cambridge. Now, there's statistics that goes along with this. Um, together with Matthew Kahn, I have estimated carbon emissions associated with living in different parts of the United States. People who live in dense areas typically use far less carbon, holding income and family size constant than people who live in low-density areas. This is both because of the structures that they live in, and typically it's just because of smaller structures, not because high density intrinsically is, is low carbon, because they're living in smaller apartments, but also because of driving around. And it's important when we think about sustainability to remember what matters is not just the building, it's the whole system in which we live. Now, I know particularly about this because when I started acquiring small children, I moved from being, uh, living in a green space like Cambridge to living out in, in near Concord and doing about almost as much damage to the environment as the road did. One way to think about this is if the great growing economies of China see their per capita carbon emissions levels rise, so that's seen in the sprawling United States, global carbon emissions go up by 130%. If they stop at the level seen at wealthy but hyperdense Hong Kong, global carbon emissions go up by less than 30%. Right? A huge difference, a huge advantage for building up rather than building out. And of course, cities remain at enormous risk from, from this. Now, I'm ending now, but I don't want to end on the risk of climate change. The fundamental lesson, the fundamental point here is that, and this is of course an image of the Velvet Revolution, is that cities have been doing miracles for millennia that when human beings are connected, it's not just that we become more economically productive, it's not just that we become more culturally vibrant, we are able to give birth to democracy. We're able to give birth to freedom when we work together. Look, they call the Tarrier Square e event the Facebook revolution, but it wouldn't have happened if people had just unfriended Mubarak on their Facebook accounts. They actually needed to take to the streets, as people did in Prague in 1989, to actually force change, to force democracy for coming. And this, this ultimately, is the great triumph of the city. And that is ultimately what we hear about, is a greater world, not just because of spaces that are fun, but because of spaces that enable humanity to work miracles, like the miracles that happened right here in Prague. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Thank you. Glazier. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um,
which is uh, deeply interesting and um, raises so many questions, so we'll try to open them up. I'll just ask a couple. Um, you, you talk about uh, allowing growth and density and promoting uh, cities uh, to build taller buildings and so forth. So let me ask you the reverse question. I mean, in your scenario of how cities, how healthy cities operate, what, is the, what are the kind of regulatory uh, instruments that are crucial to preserving uh, things like equity, opportunity, uh, diverse neighborhoods? Um, because one can see, as you said, about Greenwich Village, for instance, which is also my neighborhood where I grew up and where I can no longer afford to live, <laughs> that it has indeed become a place um, uh, for one small uh, class of people. At the same time, it's part of a larger ecosystem in the city as well, I have to admit, in which there are other neighborhoods that grow uh, precisely because people can't afford to live there. So the question to you is, let's flip the coin, let's just not talk about allowing growth to happen, uh, but let's say, what are your views about the, the key instruments of, of regulation that make sure cities grow in, in healthy ways and provide opportunity? Well, it's, it's not as if I believe in any sense in a completely deregulated city. I think there's certainly a need for historic preservation for those, those buildings that actually do matter. Um, I do think in New York that the preservation districts, rather than the preserving specific buildings, but the pre preservation districts are, are perhaps excessive. Um, this has the impact, of course, of pushing up prices in some areas, and certainly we've seen um, uh, good evidence of the restrictions of uh, building pushing up, pushing up prices. But um, that doesn't mean that we don't need to have any. There, there are limits if you think about how to create a just society, how to create a just city. Uh, I think it's important to remember that, in fact, the tools of physical planning are rarely the right tools to do that with. Right? That, in fact, as much as we love architecture, we should remember what things are actually effective for creating a more equal society and which ones are not. So, for example, when I think about greater income equality and opportunity within the United States, I think, first of all, about schools, about early childhood interventions, about things that actually create skills, which are the direct way in which we empower younger people to actually find a brighter future, rather than thinking that by regulating the physical environment, we're actually going to uh, affect meaningful change. And I think it's very hard to regulate your way towards affordable housing. Um, that being said, obviously, I think that in the U.S. has programs like Section 8 housing vouchers that are, somewhat, that are somewhat desirable. And, of course, regulations that are related to public health are also na naturally appropriate. But, but, you're not, but you think affordable housing as a particular... You think if you just increase the supply that the prices will come down? This doesn't happen in New York. It's not happening in San Francisco. Where is this happening? Well, the, the, given the, the level of affordable housing, given the level of housing that's being produced in San Francisco, I, don't th I think that's not evidence of anything. Uh, no, I mean, you know, the, the, the U.S. example, the places that are great at, at you know, that are paragons of affordable housing in the U.S., Texas, mm -hmm. right? Texas is affordable because they unleash the developers, right? Again, it's not, you know, supply and demand are not, are not uh, workable. Now, there's a reasonable point that New York and San Francisco are so far from having, you know, uh, the 100,000 units a year that New York City produced in the early 1920s, right? That's such a, such a world that's sort of impossible to think about. We're in some sort of very, very sort of, you know, on the edges world where we're imagining producing a small amount of affordable housing in order to get a mixture of people living. And I'm not against that. I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But when you have affordable units that are designated affordable, which means that you get them by lottery, you're stuck in them, it's very different than real affordability, which means that anyone can come to the city and can rent an apartment for a reasonable price. And this sort of bifurcated strategy that New York is following, and many cities are following, of creating one set of market rate things that are wildly expensive, that you then say, well, it's okay because we've created a small number of affordable units on the edge that if you're lucky enough to get, I see that as being decidedly less attractive than a world in which we have just widespread affordable housing. We don't even need to go back to the 20s in New York. Just think about the sort of, you know, flurry of glazed brick buildings that occurred in the years after, after which, you know, the kind of thing that I grew up in in, in New York, right, which, is, which was about providing affordable rental housing for ordinary New Yorkers. Um, well, I don't want to uh, monopolize too much conversation here uh, about the New York and where we're in Europe, of course, where you have a social compact that, um, um, by, by which citizens in a country like this have certain expectations of uh, decent streets, decent schools, decent transit, decent train stations, and a certain uh, support from the government. Do you, uh, from what you're saying, since you seem to believe that the, you know, allowing the free market in, in terms of development to, uh, to have a freer hand, um, I mean, do you feel that the European social system is in some way, uh, therefore, you know, not aiming towards better cities? No, no, no. These things are, I mean, that was my point about schools, 
right? There are, there are things that we want the government to do, and there are things that we want the government not to do, right? So let's take a more extreme example. Let's go to India, right? India has a complete failure of public provision of basic necessities, right? When you look at India, it would be insane to look at Indian cities and say, boy, the problem is here there's too much government. The problem is there's not, no government that's providing the very basic things that you want from cities. Yet at the same time, Mumbai has labored under a 1.25 floor area ratio for much of the last 45 years, meaning that the average height of new buildings needs to be one and a quarter. That is insanity, right? So it's, it's one thing to say that we, I don't want these restrictions, but at the same time to say, I want better water, I want better transportation, I want better schools, I want things that every Indian child deserves to have. In the same sense, I can be an enormous fan of many parts of the European system and indeed the European welfare system. I can tell you that at least twice in the last five years with my kids, I've had the treat of actually being, well, I guess going to see emergency health care should never be a treat. But I can tell you relative to the US example, both in terms of price and in terms of competence, both Italian and Spanish care was absolutely a treat. So there's many things that the US can learn from Europe in creating a more just society, but over restricting the building of new construction is not one of them. So, in a place like Prague, where you have a very beautiful historic center, where I presume people might wish to live, would you then lift restrictions on uh, building tall buildings, say, in the center of the city? You again need to be sensitive about this, right? So the key is to figure out areas in which you can allow more density to be built that don't do a grave injustice to a gem of world civilization. Right? So the question is, how in the world do you actually protect what is precious? At the same time, you, you allow there to be more space for the city to grow. And for sure, the central part of Prague is indeed you know, a, a gem of civilization. Of course it deserves protection. The question is where you draw the line, and that's not my job to draw the line. But we have to remember, the further that you push out development, right, the more cost you impose on the people who want to be connected to it. Right? So France, of course, is, has gone, in a certain sense, Canary Wharf is like this in London as well, has gone towards delivering density at a fairly far off distance. Now, I've, I've actually walked from La Défense to Champs-Élysées, right? So it's, it certainly is doable, but there's no question it's not, not really part of the French experience. I personally think, despite the problems with the main Montparnasse Tower, that would have been possible in that area to actually deliver a little bit more without doing, you know, without running roughshod of, over the Place des Vosges. I mean, these are, these are different things. Um, and in the same sense, you need to think about the right balance between delivering space where it's valuable and protecting what is precious in world civilization. Let, let me open this up into questions if I'm, I don't want to monopolize the entire uh, uh, question, but if somebody has one, let me, uh, yeah, and maybe someone can hand a microphone over this way. Um, my name is Jantrenka. Thank you very much for a great talk. Um, some of the things that you mentioned but it, you didn't really comment on pointed to an inherent instability or fragility of cities. I mean, you can see that they go through cycles of bust and booms, Detroit, New York in the 70s. Uh, could you comment maybe on that? And also that cities seem to also produce or <clears throat> introduce instability into the, into the world. I mean, if, if you look at the, um, the financial crisis of 2008, um, that was also produced in the city. So could you comment on the fragility or instability that goes with, uh, with cities? Yes, yes, they're both, they're both great comments, and it's exactly right. So if your model of the, what cities do in the 21st century, and indeed in the 15th century, is the most important thing is this connections of people to learn from one another who come up with these great ideas that sort of you know, empower the city. That's your model, and you need to recognize at least two potential downsides of this. One of which is the flow of ideas is never guaranteed, right? It's always a sporadic thing, as those of us who are in the idea business and pretty much everyone in this room knows, we all hit dry periods as much as we try not to, right? And not just a person, but a city can hit a dry period. Now, I happen to think there are things that you can do to reduce the chances of that, but it's always possible. So, again, the sort of more that your city gets dominated by a few large vertically integrated firms like Detroit, the more likely I think it is that the ideas are going to dry up. The more that you're sort of open to small startup firms, the less likely that's going to happen. But you can certainly have dry periods in terms of small startup firms as well. And you also have a tendency, even with small startup firms, to evolve. Right? There are a couple of firms which end up being dominant, which evolve towards the big firm model. I think you see this in Silicon Valley today, which in the 60s and 70s looked like a world of nimble startups and sort of moved to, has moved towards a world of larger behemoths. Now, they're very creativity-oriented behemoths, but it's still dangerous. And remember, Detroit in the 1890s looked a lot like Silicon Valley in the 1960s did. Right? It was a place marked by small, nimble firms. It just evolved towards these large, less-than-creative behemoths. Second point is, look, we're human beings, right? We're not saints. We're conceived in sin and born in corruption. And the fact that cities enable human ingenuity means it enables human ingenuity for evil as well as good. I think in, in every detective novel that you've ever read, the, the great criminal genius comes out of the city almost surely. I can't think of anyone who was born in, in nature and purely acquired this stuff on his, on his own. So that is certainly right. And 
um, I think we should continue to expect that as well, that you know, not every financial innovation is for the good. And while I believe in less regulation of building heights, that is not a statement that I believe in less regulation for everything. And I certainly believe in more and smarter regulation for financial services, which is absolutely crucial, because otherwise this innovation runs amok and causes great damage to the world. Let me just ask you, since you mentioned Silicon Valley, you write about Silicon Valley too. And you write about it in a way that tries to make it fit in with the density issues and, and other urban kind of uh, benefits that you, that you identify. But Silicon Valley is a suburban place where people do drive. You have the campuses now of places like Apple, which are essentially going to become office parks, just yeah. fancy looking ones. So in what sense do you actually uh, correlate a place like Silicon Valley, which has been obviously a center of innovation and, uh, and economic growth, um, with this idea of dense cities and, uh, and healthy uh, societies. So on one level, I mean, of course, Silicon Valley is exactly a, a you know, sign of everything that I've been talking about, right? I mean, if you think about you know, face-to-face -face contact and new technologies, right, there's no company that should have been able to do long-distance learning better than Google long distance production better than Google, right? No company that should have been able to say, oh, just go home and you know, do your stuff and just zap it in. But of course, Google builds the Googleplex. Google buys a million square feet on downtown Manhattan. They sort of believe completely in face-to-face -face contact. Marissa Meyer, CEO of Yahoo, right? Instead of saying to her workers, just go home, just dial it in, she says, you've got to actually show up and, and work here. Now, the cluster of Silicon Valley, built very much around Stanford, right, and it's, a, it's been a century in the, in the building, is very much an example of face-to-face -face contact, but it certainly has been, for the last 50 years, based around the car. So people would get together from different firms, meet at Walker's Wagon Wheel after, after uh, work on Friday, share ideas over drinks, in some sense a quintessential urban experience, but then, of course, they would drive home. Um, it clearly was doable. It was doable in part because there wasn't anything else there, because they were a very dominant industry in the area. And there we have to ask the sort of Jane Jacobs question as to whether or not the lack of connection with other industries right, is going to make the industry less fertile in the long run. I think the other thing that's sort of interesting to think about in Silicon Valley is that we sort of are, do seem to be careening to a few large firm models. Now, there are large firms that worship face-to-face -face interactions, but they're not these small firm interactive models, which I think tends to be the natural in office parks, that you get these very large firms. And then there's a question as to whether or not this is sustainable in the long run. But um, it is a car city, not a walking city, and it's fundamentally very, very different in terms of its feel, and I think we're going to have to see how it plays out. Okay, I have to be bad policeman, so we have questions. Sure. Only one time for one question. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for extremely optimistic uh, <clears throat> presentation. That, that's, that's the way I have sensed it. I think we need that in Europe. I think it's American. <clears throat> I have one question. There is a, a, an important debate now about the book of uh, Thomas Piketty, uh, uh, The Capital in the 21st Century. Uh, basically, if he is right, and that's the debate, <clears throat> he says that we are going back to the 19th century where the majority of property and capital is uh, accumulating in the hands of very, very few. He speaks about 1% of the top. And he says that now, in this century, we are getting close to the same situation. If, if you take part in that debate, what do you think will be the effect for the cities, because your story is very optimistic, but if Piketty is right, there's not much reason for optimism. Look, I mean, if you think, if you look at the heart of the Piketty data, especially for Europe, especially for France and Italy, the rise in capital relative to GDP is dominated by rise in real estate values. Okay, rise in, rise in prices. That actually is what is, you just go to his data, which I've spent a fair amount of time with. Um, and it's really about rising prices in high demand areas. It's about higher prices in Paris, it's about higher prices in Rome. There are a couple of things that you should take away from this. One of which is that the residents of Paris who own property are both better and worse off because we're of rising prices. The value of their asset, their apartments has gone up, but the cost of living in the city that they love has also similarly gone up. If they were planning on living in the city forever, they're actually no better off as a result of this. Um, the second thing to take away from it is the most straightforward policy you know, response to rising prices into Paris is to think about how to make Paris more affordable, which is in fact what we've been talking about overall. So in fact, the, the real issue behind the in income inequality, when you actually look at what's driving rising capital, it's not that there's, you know, three guys who are sitting on a mountain of wealth that are driving all of it. It's the fact that people's apartments used to be worth 100,000 euros and now they're worth a million euros, right? And that's, that's a massive increase in the, the capital ownership for a small number of, of people. 
That being said, when I worry about inequality, uh, and I've certainly written a number of papers on inequality, I worry to a large extent about the ability, which you saw in the start of the 20th century, of a few very wealthy people to subvert the political system, in large part to subvert the justice system. And this is indeed a large problem. I see very little example of that in the US, in part because wealthy people can't agree on anything. Right? So in 1910, you had this sort of collective agreement that we, they were going to cooperate for the, for the good of monopoly and a variety of things. Here you've got the Koch brothers, for sure, who are on one side, but you know, you've got George Soros on the other, throwing just as much money on the other side. You've got this tremendous competition of ideas, and I guess that's ultimately where my, you know, where my optimism comes from, is that I, I believe that as long as you have human beings who are kept free to compete, that are not being bound by old strictures, that are able to implement their innovation and ideas, I fundamentally am optimistic. Because look, look at the track record of the past 3,000 years of humanity. Right? Look at the difference between Europe today. My father was born in Berlin in 1930. Right, he came to the United States in 1962. Fine, be pessimistic if you want, but just think about how different the world is today from the world that my father grew up in. Right? And think about what an amazing amount of progress we have made. I think short-run pessimism misses the larger point that we as a species have in fact achieved miracles. And I believe very much that we are going to continue to achieve miracles in the, in the 21st century. Actually, I see some questions, but I also have to manage the time, so we do it this way. How about uh, coffee with Mr. Glazier? And questions will be continuing uh, like out, outside and thank you for your extensive uh, lecture and your answers and we carry on for coffee thank you again <laughs>